be fine, at least in, in the, the deal that they made with the state. So um, it, it, there were lots of rings of impact uh, to these dollars. Uh, they're not all just how many jobs did you create, but what's the ripple effect and what are the feeder chain, the, the, what's the supply chain for some of the businesses that get money. That needs to be unpacked for people so they have a higher level of confidence and that we, and I promise to stop talking after this, uh, that we know as a state, uh, once we decide we're going to do this thing, uh, that we always check on an ongoing basis because there are not the resources to keep doing a new thing every year and never going back and saying, but did that other thing actually work? Or does it work any longer? Do we need to point additional resources toward it because it's actually going gangbusters? Or has it failed to be a economic development tool and has morphed into a subsidy of some sort? And then we have a debate about that as well um, because there are certain circumstances where a subsidy may be the appropriate thing, but let's call it what it is and not call it uh, something that's not. So I'll stop talking now. Um, I'm really curious because you used the word about <coughs> unpack because that was going to be what I was going to ask about anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that there is so much confusion in Connecticut about these programs? And that said, I mean, news organizations certainly have written a lot about them. And um, one of the ways that I know there's confusion and there's um, there's a level sometimes of bitterness or um, or cynicism is that we have um, that we can we have people commenting on our on stories on websites and I see them in there. So why why do people? Why are they confused, and what can be done to help people understand it in a way that really means something to them? So it's, it's a multi-part answer, as you might imagine. So look, in an ideal world, we wouldn't have 50 governors competing with each other to woo a company back and forth and across state lines. Uh, so, but that is happening. And so a decision needs to be made, are we going to engage in that or not? I think unilateral disarmament in that battle is probably uh, going to have a short-term negative impact <laughs> for the economy of Connecticut as some folks flee uh, and go to the better deal uh, that may be offered them. So that's number one. Number two is you really hear about the successes uh, in a way that people say, okay, I see what the long-term plan is. I see where we're headed. And instead, you get state government doing um, the shiny thing. Uh, they sort of always saying, OK, this is the new thing. And then here's the new thing. And here we're cutting a ribbon on a pizza joint. And here we're going to do biotech. And here we're going to do this other thing. And that, on one level, says, well, this is you know, activity. We need this sort of energy around this question. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't create a situation where people can actually focus on what are the pillars and how are we marching toward their expansion and uh, having those improve our economy. The other thing is there's a lot of bad feelings around this. So if I'm an engineer and you're an engineer, I got money you didn't, I'm happy you're not. But you're not the only one who is happy. That engineering firm's unhappy, that engineer. So my Democratic colleagues sometimes get concerned that I, when I believe that picking winners and losers in a market is really going to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, they get Ang ang not angry, but concerned when I say that because it's a Republican talking point, that winners and losers thing. But when we interfere in a marketplace, um, it has consequences. Some of them can be good, some of them not so good. Now, I'm not naive. Like I get why this happens, and I want to believe that most of it happens for good intentions. Uh, but all you need in an, uh, at a time when revenue is uncertain, programs are cut to see these big deals happening and feel like, well, why that and not core, core mission, core services helping people? That's in part what was behind you know, my no vote on the Bridgewater deal. <coughs> we had two weeks before the Bridgewater deal said no to parents of kids with developmental disabilities. Services are getting cut back. Go to the Bond Commission, $22 million for Bridgewater, the largest hedge fund in the world. I don't have any argument with their business model, but these are the most sophisticated financial players on the planet. They need $22 million of Connecticut dollars? That's a question. Can we do that with a straight face? That's a question. And then the structure of the deal itself said that $22 million in Connecticut dollars was going to 
leverage 500 million in Bridgewater dollars. 22 doesn't leverage 500. 22 is, we care about you and your industry. We're sorry we've been bad partners. Please don't leave us. It's a whole bunch of things. But it's not leveraging 500 million, and it doesn't lead to a sophisticated player like a hedge fund hiring X number of people that they don't need. They're always going to hire who they need based on the ROI on those positions. So the question from Chris Davis, who was the Republican House member who also voted no on that deal, was how long before the next hedge fund comes to the Bond Commission? And the answer to that question is two weeks. Uh, two months, rather. Two months later, there was another one on the agenda. So there isn't a... People see that. They felt the pain. They seen the tax increases, and they wonder, what are we doing? Now, the governor said <coughs> in the press conference after the no vote on Bridgewater, well, the controller didn't like this deal, and what would he have said had Bridgewater upped and left? And I would just say the answer to that is in past behavior. The controller would have said nothing, because sophisticated financial players are always going to make a rational decision based on what's best for them keeping in mind that they have an employer base as well that may or may not want to stay in that space, right? So they're going to try to balance what's financially right for us in the company and what are the needs of our employees. And more often than not, the, you know, the needs of the corporate needs outpace the individual needs. So um, skepticism. Why is it that we can't get answers as to what kind of jobs are created, like with first five? Mm -hmm. um, one of the big things we asked was, what kind of jobs are there? These people got a lot of money. We're being told that they created X amount of jobs, but we're not being told what those jobs are mm -hmm. and how much they pay. Mm -hmm. If you create 300 jobs and a minimum wage, well then, you're really not, you're really not creating jobs. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not something that gives people, what, $50 million, I think it is, in tax breaks or mm -hmm. whatever for, say, mm -hmm. Lexion. So, I mean, don't you think um, it's the lack of transparency when that question is being asked over and over, and maybe that's the reason why people are skeptical? That right. they don't answer that question. What kind of jobs? Cer certainly, th that's a, a layer of skepticism around folks who follow this closely, right? Because they, they know how hard it is to get at that information. I think with this deeper dig that we're proposing, you're going to see not only a top-line, well-packed, run the analysis of what's the economic impact of this, but unpacked, what is the, what are the payroll numbers? What are the payroll dollars? What are the job classes? What are the ripples of those? What are the supply chain impacts of that? And you see all of that up to and including property tax impact, uh, nonprofit donation impact, all the things that are actually the primary problem with the exodus of GE from Fairfield. You know, it's the loss of property taxes, the loss of income tax, and the loss of charitable giving. Those are the things, because corporate-wise, there wasn't a lot of, you know, tax dollars on the table there. So, yes, you, you get to a deeper level of analysis, and you'll get the answers. We'll all get the answers that, that we see. And in a way, in a way that, that people, you think, will, sort of going back to my previous point, mm -hmm. will say, okay, I get this, I get and I get, mm -hmm. I get it that... Um, that, that that detail isn't hedge fund talk, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's real talk for real people. Right, so, and that's the difference sort of between uh, the Sikorsky deal and the Bridgewater deal. Like, they're, they're not equal in dollars, but just to sort of use those two. I said when I voted no on the Bridgewater deal that if it had been 22 $1 million manufacturing assistance grants, now this is, this is more, philosophical economic development stuff, right? If it had been $22 $1 million, I would have been all over that. If it had taken that $22 million and expanded training opportunity for kids at the community technical college to build more infrastructure to get those kids and send them to work, I would have been all over that. Because we do this thing. It's a revenue preservation strategy. So we take some money here, we throw it up high, it gets gobbled up by someone like Bridgewater because we know in 12 months that revenue is going to rain down and that helps to build the revenue stream for the next budget cycle. So it's this up to the top and then it rains down revenue. That's fine, but that's not economic development. That's just a revenue preservation strategy trying just not to have the whole thing go south. If you redeploy those same dollars, really targeting 
middle class job creation where we know our kids will have a place to work. The idea that I had a 70 to 80 percent chance of living a better standard of living than my parents and my kid has a 50 to 50 shot, 50, 50 shot is at the heart of what's wrong right now. So if you build a middle class job creation program, that is everything from biotech to defense to you know manufacturing, both simple manufacturing as well as high tolerance manufacturing, then you really give people who are struggling to stay in the middle class or those who aspire to be in the middle class a place to go. Right now it's like the it's almost as if it's the, uh, what's that football right. movie, the football movie, you know, like, okay, so the kid goes, thank you. Know, you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's that scene, right, because we all believe that the kid who grew up in poverty is going to go work for the largest hedge fund in the world, and sometimes it happens. But most of the time it doesn't. It's an incremental step, right? So to leave the community technical colleges, because now I had an opportunity to go there and to jump into a job in the supply chain for Sikorsky and be making 50, 60 on the shop floor, that builds a base that allows you to count on an economy for the next 20 and 30 years, not just until you stop doing this. The people who talk a lot about the 22 billionaires who became the 19, who became the 17, and I think we're at 15, maybe there's a new one now. Yeah, there's a 17. Now. There's a new one now. So that's great. But we spend a lot of time thinking about them, and I think that's a mistake. Well, because if they leave, And they're that's always going to do the rational I thing. I mean, we are not going to compete with a state that doesn't have a state income tax, right? If that's the whole thing is, I don't like the tax burden. But when you start to be a good partner, when you start to be consistent, when you start to sort of lay out a vision and then work toward it, when, when state government like understands it's not the story and, and that we just have a role to play, but we're not the ones that are the story, suddenly you see organically an economy built on our strengths, productivity of the workforce, PhDs per capita, teachers, nurses, healthcare, higher ed, all of that start to actually build again. Um, sometimes I wonder if we're doing more harm than good. How are disrupting what's going on? I'm sorry, no. Uh, how do you analyze? I was on a tear, so I'm glad you can do this. How do you analyze the in, uh, intangibles, though? I mean, there are those that would argue that GE was gone anyway, that it, that just the the relationship with Governor Malloy was icing on the cake, that, that you know, a, a goodbye kiss at the door. Mm -hmm. But the GE, from what it was when it moved out of Manhattan to the Fairfield is a totally different company now. It's a technology company. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to be in Boston because of the, the schools and the whole schmear, if you will. But uh, if, you're, if a government is going out and making a desperate attempt to keep a company here, mm -hmm. let's say that they've done that with GE, um, I mean, on one hand, you know, you can feel good about it, but you're throwing a lot of money after a company that, you know, eventually is going to move anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it, how, does, how, does, how do you throw in the intangibles uh, into the analysis of this? So, so there, there are metrics to measure sort of the, out, the outer ring impacts of any of these deals. So, and I'll leave the economists to do that. that. That's, you know, I don't want to get too out of my depth on that. But to stay with the GE example for a second, you're right. In my view, and I think in the view of many, there are multiple reasons why GE left um, and had been pre-decided, pre uh, you know, well before it actually happened. So whether it was we want a change in space, we're a more creative company, we want to be downtown, Boston, vibrant, you know, we want to be there, or whether it is, you know, we want to get, we want to dump the Jack Welch guys and we want to take the Immel people, we want to go right to Boston. Um, for me, and, and, and I think it, this is potentially, I want to say this in the right way so it doesn't sound tone deaf, it's a loss, you know, when they pull out of that space and it's a loss. But for me, the bigger loss in the whole GE thing was the establishment of 100 new R&D tech folks for GE in Providence. So yes, they took their, their leadership and they went out to, to Boston. But then they established, like almost on our border, flipping us the bird that they went to Providence when they could just have easily been in New Haven. Same skill set. Now, we have a responsibility as well because they're looking at the state balance sheet. They're looking at persistent deficits. They're looking at budget cuts and tax increases. They were looking at the unfunded liability and the pension fund that we've talked about at nauseam. They're looking at all of that stuff and said, 
the uncertainty here, on top of everything else, on top of changing the rules every year, two years, three years, is just uncertainty is the absolute enemy to all of this. The final piece I'll say is you have to decide how the chief executive engages in that activity. And the bigger the deal, the closer it needs to be to the top. But whether it's Israeli companies that want a foothold in New England, and why not Connecticut? Well then, you know, there's a, a willing thing that has to happen there with the chief executive. It can't happen three layers, you know, under a commissioner and have people talking. It, it's just not the way it's played anymore. But it's got to be related uh, to our strengths. And when we redeploy dollars, and this is not exactly related to your question, but that same $22 million example, when you pull back from the depths of an economic crisis, where absolutely state and federal dollars keep the engine or the gears of an economy moving so they don't seize up, as it starts to move on its own, it's our responsibility to pull back at that point and redeploy those same dollars to more broad-based economic development. And that includes infrastructure, job training, pipeline stuff. That's kind of things we do well. The pick and winners and losers thing, we're really not very good at it. Even when they're successful. Why does, why does Connecticut do that so much then? I mean, uh, you know, that may be a little bit off the topic we're talking about, but we've heard a lot from the energy folks in the mm -hmm. past mm -hmm. month or so. Mm -hmm. And um, and, and that's, that's, the same, that's the same issue with them, is mm -hmm. the state of Connecticut picking winners and losers. And, and, and it really sort of plays out that way when you listen to both sides, yep. is, that, is that that's what they're doing. And if you're, if you're giving a bid here, a bid there, a bid there, not there, not there, not there, and it leaves everybody scratching their head, mm -hmm. And they can't even figure out why it was done. Then, then that's a public perception problem too. Yes, and so the energy sector is one, one example of that, and the fuel cell piece of that is a piece of that as well. well so so is the nuclear. when you've got deep in DCD looking at these companies differently, when we're heavily invested on the DC DCD side of fuel cell, and then they're not a renewable technology on the deep side. You know that might be the right answer, but these things have to work together. There's something about a, uh, an administrative process that's consistent, and people understand how that all works. But then it's more philosophical, it, and it's big things. So it's like trying to hit a home run every time. You know, sometimes you just have to figure out what's the strategic decision here. Singles and doubles, singles and doubles, and just keep working it through. And that's the second sports <laughs> reference I gave, <laughs> and I do not follow the hockey and the XS under any of them. Yeah, UConn women's soap. Right, so so but, um, uh, yeah, so but I mean, before before we go off onto other topics, just in case, in terms of your proposal, in terms of status. Um, what is what is the status? Right okay, now? so it does not have a number as of the time that we left the office. It is uh, coming out a of bill number. a bill number. Yeah. It is coming out of the finance committee, likely later this week. There will be a public hearing. You know, finance and approach have later uh, timelines than the other committees. Um, there seems to be broad-based support. Though I've been surprised before, I don't know at this point what the administration will do. I've been surprised before, um, and we'll just keep working it. I think there's some lessons to be learned from how things went down last time, um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, the governor has learned some of those as well. I get from the executive authority position that you never want to look like you're ceding any piece of executive authority, right? There's something about protecting that that's unique to chief executives, no matter what venue they're in. Um, but this one is, uh, it's a losing proposition to continue to just double down on this is the way, you know, it's, there's nothing to see here, which is really the takeaway. We got this, there's nothing to see here. But meanwhile, there's a lot to see. And which is what leaves, would leave the public wondering. Right. Um, one of the things you said that, um, and I think it's Joe Brennan, CBIA, has um, said also is that um, the governors fighting against each other to yes. bring different companies to different states. So what is the answer? I mean, if, uh, because we can always one up the other, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you can always. So what is what is the answer? How do we keep our companies here right. and not, you know, how how do we do that? Well, can I just note one thing yeah. and uh, agree with that? But it, it's international. It's not just the same state. Because we're fighting for the same right. companies. Germany want, right. you know, has yeah. or wants. Yeah, yeah. 
so look, Connecticut's always going to be Connecticut. The Connecticut we're going to be 10 years from now is an unknown. But we have some idea of where we will be headed if we play to our strengths. If we do Connecticut really well, with all of the strengths that we have, and we don't talk about the strengths a ton, but we've got a ton of strengths, then you win in many of those battles. Right? But it's when you try to be Raleigh or Charlotte or Charleston, or like when you try to be a Florida without an income tax or a right to work state, or a, we're not like we're gray, we're changing, our demographics are changing, we sit on the ledge, we've got brownfields, we're an old industrial thing, we've got all of that that could, you could look at it and say, well, that's, that's a challenge. But in some ways, it's the, really the bedrock of our strength. All of this comes out of that experience. We've reinvented ourselves so many times, but at this point, Connecticut government thinks it knows where we ought to be headed. And we don't spend enough time talking to the existing leaders of the existing pillars of our economy and see what they're saying. Um, you know, even CBIA, I don't like. We sometimes really go like on certain issues, but they want to be partners in all of this, and they're not just coming up saying the tax rate is too high. It's really about something much more nuanced and uh, than that. Uh, so, those billionaires in Fairfield County. You know, they're better off in Connecticut than they'd be in New York and New Jersey. We know that on the numbers, but it's the uncertainty That's right now that needs we've to be heard changed. That, we've heard that repeatedly mm -hmm. over the past couple of years is that uncertainty is a, yes. a very big issue. Yeah, yeah. It abhors, the way everything abhors a vacuum. We, we've got this, like, what's going to happen next. But again, we've been hearing it too for years. <laughs> so but that's, you know, we come back in and we keep changing the rules every year, sometimes twice in the same year. That's, you know, even if it's a good idea, like how about we just say, okay, no, we're not going to change the tax code in the same year, absent an emergency, that you propose a change to the tax code. We're going to send it out for evaluation. We're going to measure the impact of that, understand what it's going to look like five and ten years later. Next session we'll come back in and then we'll debate it. What a message would that send? And it's no skin off our nose to do that. It's no skin off our nose to do that. But it's got to be collaborative. How do you decide, in, in some cases, um, you, again, going back to the subject of picking winners and losers, I've got the register long enough to see two biotech cycles run through in this uh, general area. Mm -hmm. um, and most of the ones that were here when I first got here in 1997 have either withered in the vine or been bought. I mean, I, mm -hmm. there's like one or two I can probably think of. Everybody wants biotech. Boston wants biotech. The Research Triangle wants biotech. Mm -hmm. Are we better off seeding something that's like a, a really competitive area? Or are we saying, well, we've got Yale here, we've got UConn here, and mm -hmm. we've been fortunate enough to lure Jackson Laboratories here and just ignore the level of competition that's there? I think we need to decide if we wanted to try to be number one in bioscience or number three. Uh, the part of me would also like to be a solid number three. Work to preserve those companies. Help with basic science that helps to drive you know, innovation. Be a partner, whether it's through CI or through other, other means of state government, to actually move stuff from the lab bench to the next phase or from that phase to the, the following phase. But not just drop money on folks. Like, take a piece of the action, right? So CI has got this sort of loan program. There's a payback. There's some states that do direct investment. We, we're in. We're in for 5%. Here's the dollar. But when and if that thing starts to pay off, that becomes a revenue generator for the state. So now we're like, you know, you measure things in a slightly different way. Whether we've got the skills to, we can find the skills to do that, to figure out what it's going to be. Bioscience is one piece. Defense is another. Civilian-related sort of activity is a part of that. And manufacturing. We've got more manufacturing per capita than most states in the union. We all know that to be true. But then sometimes you hear messages coming out of state government like, we're not interested in building widgets. We're all about widgets. We're all about widgets. We've got a ton of them being made in Connecticut. 
But some of the, don't you think, is political hubris. It's not as sexy to go and, and then create two or three or five or ten jobs at a place in Nagatak or in Seymour. Right. It's a lot sexier to say, well, we just, uh, you know, plunk down a whole lot of money and then 200, 300 jobs at right. Alexion. Imagine a future. We'll imagine it together. But yeah, well, five people going back to work in manufacturing is a far more meaningful investment in my, in my view. Th those are the jobs. They are more labor intensive to, to sort of build, both from the employer side and from an analysis side, from the state side. But, but that's where our strength is. It's always been our strength. And that seems to be so a message, too, that I think sometimes is lost, is sort of that supply chain message and, right. and the number of businesses in Connecticut that even, for example, have to support a Sikorsky, let's just use that as an example because mm -hmm. it comes to mind, but the different companies that have to exist with those employees to support that. Right. Um, and I think people uh, oftentimes forget that mm -hmm. um, because they're looking at the two and three hundred um, right. level ones. I mean, so I, 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 the, the number one sort of measure for me has got to be value, right? So what, when you add value to whatever it is, then that's something we need to keep track of. So on the manufacturing side, it's really clear to see we're taking raw material and turning them into the first phase of whatever it is. And then from that phase to the fan blade, and from the fan blade to the engine, from the engine to the air aircraft, that's adding value all along that chain. On the financial side, I can give you 100,000, you can turn it into 120,000. We know you can do that. But what's, so I guess the value is the 20,000, right? But that's not, you know, that doesn't have the same sort of deep roots that feed others. It's like one guy in a room making 120 out of 100. That's good, and those folks need to do, do that. But when it comes to our investment, those jobs that add value to product and then move it in from somewhere and then move it out to somewhere, then you're in the sweet spot. Anything between the, the, the raw product and the finished product is the space where we need to live. How do you go about making sure that some of these jobs um, go in within us into the cities? I mean, one of the things about New Haven being a biotech center mm -hmm. is that y you stop and think about it, and the kids that are going to uh, high school right now in New Haven, mm -hmm. it's going to be a couple of years before they are able to qualify for even the basic entry level jobs. Mm -hmm. And it just seems to me like, you know, it's terrific to add jobs at all, mm -hmm. but it's even better if you can do it in a, in a place where it's harder to find jobs that are above minimum wage. Mm -hmm. how, do, how do you use the um, uh, incentives to, to build an economy that helps the inner city grow? Mm -hmm. That's a much bigger question than there. Um, so just a couple of thoughts. It's not completely uh, formulated in my mind. But um, one is we can always structure the deal the way we want the deal to be structured. And we do it on the construction side all the time. Right? You're doing the project. You have to hire from. The, the city in this case where the job is created and a certain percentage of folks need to reflect the community and, you know that live in the immediate vicinity you know that's all sort of important pieces of this but in the self-interest of the employer there is a, a feeder chain problem or feeder stream problem mm -hmm. with filling some of these jobs so I pull back and look at what we're doing you know I run the core financial system right so it's kind of boring but it's sort of it's the blinking financial heart of the state there's a lot of activity we need a specific kind of skill set I can't hire the people I need both because of budget constraints and because what I'm willing to pay the guy who or gal who can go and work in the private sector doing the same thing they, they're going to get paid much more there. And with all the uncertainty that's been introduced into state government of late, they're like, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to do this. So, okay, I can't find them. So my other options are I can buy them from a, you know, a body shop, a consulting firm, and have them come in and do it, or I can grab them as undergrads or coming out with an associate's degree in computer science and bring them into an apprenticeship training program and train them the way we want them. Understanding I'm probably still going to lose them five years after they're ready to ready to roll, 
but at least I have like sort of you know starting to build something in. I think these companies can do the same thing, but it's going to involve somebody doing the dotted lines between the training programs and, and the actual jobs. You think they're eager to do it, or you think that you need to use the bully pulpit to convince them that it's in their best interest? I think Mark Berlini uh, called it the frozen carrot, right? We always talk about carrots and sticks. Mm -hmm. The frozen carrot is the thing, like right now it's a weapon, but if you wait a little bit, <laughs> it's going to be a food thing, you know? So I think it's, it's worth thinking about. We don't always have to pummel people. And we don't, don't always need to buy them off. There's something sometimes in between. And some of these corporate, not lots of these corporate executives want to do good stuff. I mean, these are not like, you know, demons, right? They want to do some good things. But, but, uh, but, but let's take Alexion as an example, though. I mean, they, they were in Science Park. They left to go to Cheshire. And I'm not exactly sure. Well, I, I have a theory as to why they left, but. Um, and now we, we pay, essentially paid them to come back to New Haven. Mm -hmm. Why not skip the middle step? And I'm from Cheshire, so I, it was terrific that they were out there for as long as they were. But why not skip the middle step and avoid having to pay them and find some space for them in New Haven so that you eliminated the middle step? Well, yeah, that, that assumes like a decade ago or however long ago it was that you would have known what their need would be, what the changing footprint of bioscience in downtown New Haven would be. I mean, I don't know if there's any real way to know that. Maybe there is, but I, I don't know that you could forecast that that far out. Well, one thing I know, um, 2004, 2005, I was in an Ed Board meeting, um, and the topic of conversation was there were no plumbers, no, you know, mm -hmm. there was none of that. It is 11 years later, mm -hmm. we're still having the same conversation. Yes. That they are in So I'm not getting it. Why is it taking so long to get people right. to work? Why is it taking so long to get these young people into these um, mm -hmm. professions? I don't get it. It's 11 years. So when I was healthcare advocate before I ran for office, we had a whole conversation about what's going to happen with the, with the network of primary care providers because they were kind of aging and the ones that were in individual or two-person practices were like, you know, we're done, we're retiring, we're not going to change as the system changes. We own the factory of doctor making. You know, we, the doctor making factory. We own one of those, and there's another one that sits here that's in you know private hands. You, you can retool that. It's just can you attract the people and make sure you know, that that's sort of medicine, which is more expensive, and there's lots of other things. I was at IBW last night out in Monroe, and they you know, are saying the same kinds of things. They're doing their own training. They've got their own folks ready to go, but then the work gets bottled up because we can't get jobs off the planning table at DOT and shovels in the ground in any reasonable period of time. I mean, whenever they say that the Q bridge went in under budget and ahead of schedule, I'm like, I don't know what schedule and what budget they're talking about, but that thing went, has gone on forever. And it's beautiful, but mm -hmm. you know, that's not really a measure of success in my view when I watch the Tappan Zee bridge going in like this. Um, so. <laughs> It is. Yeah. Oh, I think it's incredible. I almost like drove into the side guardrail because I was so stunned <laughs> that they were almost done putting the road plates on. Uh, so, um, so all the bridges in um, in New York, Whitestone, the same. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yes, I mean, and these are so my little one is graduating Guilford High School this year, and when I compare his experience to his old next oldest brother, who's now in his late twenties, when that older child graduated the high school. If you put in the program, like, where are you going? And it said, you know, Naugatuck Community College or as Nuntuck, because I'm going to, you know, study, you know, manufacturing stuff. People would say, like, what's wrong with your, you know, what's wrong with that kid? Like, why isn't he going to Brown or Yale or UConn or Yonis? Yeah. Now, when I listen to my, the younger one's peers, I hear them saying, I'm going to be an electrician or, you know, I'm going to trade school or I'm going, you know, I thought my dad was like, you know, wasting his time as a plumber, and now I see he's actually doing pretty well, and there's not enough of them. So I hope we're turning a corner on that argument um, and attracting yeah. folks into it, and then making sure we've got capacity to do it, because when you merge the trade schools up and into the community college system and the, the university system, um, I think they became the stepchild of that, and that's got to be unwound a little bit, um, make sure that there's mm. opportunity. Is your bill just informational? And by that I mean that the analysis would be done and it would be sort of presented and 
just be out there, or would there be something that would trigger some kind of action that would say, oh, this was a bad deal? Yeah, no. The, I mean, the public hearing is the thing. Uh, the Finance Revenue Bonding Commission uh, Committee would hold that public hearing, uh, but you can't bind legislators, right? You, we, can, I can't, we can't pass a law that says and, uh, this will happen if this other thing happens, because frankly, I don't think we can all think of the things that could happen, but it puts actionable information in front of them. Now, there's a political dynamic that occurs, right? They're going to now have actionable information in front of them, and the question will be, did you act? Right? Did you add? Did you subtract? Did you end? But right now, it's a little hard to get the information necessary to make those decisions. So are you saying that it would be more effective going forward that they could look back at this XYZ company and say, well, we didn't do a good job with this one, here's what we can do, or maybe we can do it with our own company or with the programs, more importantly. There are some programs that need deep evaluation. Are they really doing what we said they were going to do when they were established? The other question I have, sort of the elephant in the room, at least from my opinion, is how much of a factor um, in the governor's rejection of the bill last year is seeing you as a potential rival <laughs> for the governor's mansion? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I think you would probably have to ask him that question. Um, uh, look, the governor and I agree on stuff and we disagree on stuff. That's no secret. It's been the case for the last seven years. Um, we can and do work together often, mm -hmm. uh, but there are some things that we just have different philosophies, different opinions, and different ways of operating. Um, and so that just makes us different people. So I don't think so. Um, that would seem sort of petty to me, but I no, I don't see it. So you're definitely oh, you're running ready. then? No, I never said that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a trick. That was a trick. Um, um, I don't know yet. Um, so uh, I'm considering it, but, there's the, but what I'm considering right now is whether to form an exploratory committee to take, because you can't just like, I mean, you could. You could hang out there and like say, okay, now I'm ready and I'm going to act and jump in and form a campaign. I think it's really premature for that. So on whether to form an exploratory committee, I would say I'm um, you know, 95% of the way there. But that doesn't mean that you're going to do a run for governor. It just means like you need a formal structure to begin you know, putting the groundwork in to build the grassroots support that's necessary to actually get that done. Um, it, it's, it's easy to say, yeah, yeah, I'm running. You know, and people are going to say it all the time. I'm the best boy in the world. I'm the smartest. I'm the, you know, whatever it is. And of course, it's got to be me. It's my turn. Um, this is really technical stuff, and it's not sexy, and it's deep in the weeds, and the work that really needs to get done is going to mean restraint rather than action. You know, we flooded the engine in many ways and popped the clutch as well. You know, we've got to find some rhythm in there, and by that very nature, you stop thinking about it, and that doesn't make it news for it. Uh, so um, that's not going to be gratifying for people who want to cut the ribbon and smile and slap back. It's, it's not po politics. It's not, you know, I, I didn't run before for any office before this one. So I haven't spent my time sort of climbing up. And that's a message we've heard from both sides of the aisle, the one that you just shared mm -hmm. about, you know, basically finding that, finding that medium, right. you know, without popping the clutch. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's good. Wow. Very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What is it? I can't help but ask. Is it? Is it true?